My guest today is Ben Kotfis. Ben, how are you, sir? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's a beautiful day here in Chicago. Sun is shining, and I can't wait to get outside. And start the weekend. <laughs> yeah, we've been we've been lucky to have some pretty good weather weather in the Midwest this year. Absolutely. What do you do for a living, Ben? I am a principal architect at Insight, um, and I work in a group that is responsible for uh, AI-enabled apps and uh, uh, data. So we're really trying to use AI to enable some of the different workloads, as you can imagine, in um, in some of the traditional architectures that organizations are using. So the goal is really to uh, figure out how to bring AI into those workloads and scale them appropriately and you know, bring in and prepare data for those particular workloads, which is, is kind of challenging. And, and, and obviously a lot of organizations are, are trying to navigate that intelligently. Sure. Yeah. I know there's a lot of hype around artificial intelligence, particularly generative AI, you know, folks like chat GBT is just caught the public's attention by storm. Uh, is there a lot of demand for specific applications right now? There, that? yeah, I think there's a lot of demand, particularly I think in conversational agents. That's probably the area that people uh, like understand, right, right, where they understand that the best, and they are seeing it with ChatGPT, just like you mentioned. That's a conversational agent, um, and it's it's kind of right at their fingertips. And I, I do think a, the younger generations are much more familiar with that type of interaction, where. Uh, folks like myself, I, I guess we expect things to be more like a button that we click somewhere in an app. But, um, uh, you know, with Microsoft Copilot, you've got kind of that experience that's a little bit in between where you do have that available to you, but then it's it's still a conversational experience. And so I think, you know, from an organization standpoint, a lot of them are looking at um, things like um, uh, knowledge bases and help desks and things like that, where role level security isn't in play because that's still kind of challenging and, and that's that's uh, kind of maturing and that's probably the biggest area of opportunity is how do you enroll your uh, enterprise security into ai so that you you're not giving people the wrong information or the information oh, right. they shouldn't have access to uh, security is always a huge issue and we put an interesting paradigm now we have to figure out how to uh, adapt our architecture to that pattern yeah uh, to the paradigm absolutely. um now we were. Uh, I know you're you're heavily involved. You're an architect. You're designing applications and you're designing whole systems for people. And I think a lot of the time you mentioned off camera, you're spent modernizing applications. Let's talk a little bit about that. What 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 does it mean to modernize an application? Yeah, it's it's a loaded term, isn't it? And I think as, as organizations uh, start thinking about okay. I've got all these boat anchors of application code that's hard to maintain, but it's critical. I like that metaphor, to... <laughs> boat anchor of application code. <laughs> right, and 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 you know they're critical to their business process, especially when you think about mainframe applications and finance and insurance. Um, it's not some afterthought. It's not just some tool or utility. It's it's a core piece of their business, and they want to modernize that intelligently. Um, and they want to kind of build out a roadmap uh, of, of where they want to go. And, and, you know, a lot of times their goal is to run that in the cloud and they want to take advantage of efficient, uh, cost-effective infrastructure in the cloud and, and how they can actually deploy those solutions there uh, and scale them independently and, and think about what are the tools and, and features of maybe microservices or other modern architectural patterns that can help them take advantage of of that so that they can lower costs and manage those more intelligently. And so it's a pretty long road in a sense when you're coming from mainframe to, you know, start looking at, at something more modern, but that is uh, where companies are at. And, and it's hard to find talent uh, that, that are, is comfortable with working on mainframe. And so oh, yeah. there is, there's pressure really from every end to modernize these apps. And, and so really that's the driving force behind it. Okay. Uh, talk about when you when you get a project like that. Somebody says, "I need to modernize this. I need to make it more, oh, cloud native or uh, whatever." What's what's the process? What are the kind of questions you start with? So it, it really turns out to be a, a kind of a, a, a several factors, and so you know, often we're looking at the entire ecosystem of an organization, and we kind of use some tooling like Snapsnart as one tool that we'll use, and we'll kind of look at the whole 
applications ecosystem and all the apps and then start looking at you know which ones are eligible which ones are cots apps or the commercial off the shelf versus custom apps that they've developed so once we get into actually identifying a custom built application then that's where we start branching off into a decision tree that's more specific to that app as you can imagine so we kind of have those in a couple different uh, avenues one would be okay we're just going to uh, rehost this. And so we're going to just take that workload and we're going to move it to the cloud, make adjustments to connection strings, make adjustments to uh, whatever is required to run that in the cloud efficiently and take advantage of, of you know, maybe PaaS uh, SQL or um, a distributed cache or something like that that can be okay. easily hosted in the cloud. And we don't need to deal with the uh, the nuances of managing that. Uh, on so our mostly own just put it on a virtual machine and then lift and shift it into a cloud right, right. platform like Azure. Right. And, and, you know, if, if there's very little code required to do that and, and there's maybe less value or cost uh, uh, savings by moving it and, and reworking it, then that may be an opportunity or it's just overwhelming from a time perspective. And there's an upside, you know, maybe an operating system updates required and, and they're trying to get that to the cloud because of that. So there's a variety of reasons why they yeah. make one choice versus another. Outside of the rehost, there's going to be a refactor where essentially the application is working the way it's intended to work. It's giving the business value that it's supposed to give, but uh, it's gotten, you know, it just is is dated and it's not going to be able to take advantage of some of the things we just talked about, like PaaS, uh, SQL, maybe distributed caching in its current state. And so there's some refactoring required to get it into that state. Um, and that, that can be obviously fairly small and it can get pretty big. And so it's a, obviously much more, uh, it can be much more in depth than the rehost where you're leaving most things alone. Um, but you're actually making some significant adjustments to the code in order to facilitate some of the, the advantages of, of the cloud and, or, you know, just modern infrastructure in general, it's not always the cloud. And then the last bucket is going to be, uh, really you know, kind of reevaluating everything and 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 re envisioning the solution because it's not providing the business value that it's supposed to, and often that's you know everything's kind of coming together uh, into the perfect storm, and it's like we're looking at this app and we're like, do we really want to take it as is and refactor it, and or do we want to actually start from scratch and and really re envision this solution? And maybe you can combine different problems into a composite solution that that weren't in in place before, so. So those are really the three avenues and, and the, the, the most, you know, the, the re-envision is really just like any other brand new application. So, you know, you usually start with uh, user experience experts and, and visual designers, and you're kind of looking at, at that, that whole solution from, from cradle to grave, as opposed to just the technology, technology aspect of it. Uh, that third one, when you're actually rewriting the application with uh, the way it, it should exist today, that seems like the most fun. Yes, <laughs> it's the most fun and it's probably the the most uncommon, as you can imagine, because there's a large cost involved, a lot of time and, uh, you know, not only from, you know, our organization where we're doing consulting, but from the uh, from the company that we're working with, uh, their stakeholders have to invest quite a bit in order to give us sure. the right. Yeah. And they've also uh, they've got this sunk cost into this thing that they've already built, which sometimes shouldn't be a factor, but often is. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I think, every, you know, every organization, if you took a hundred applications, you know, I'd say, you know, five to 10% fall into that bucket. Some of them, you're going to probably have maybe 10, 20% that are maybe just end of life because of the fact that they do so little, they provide so little value or they could maybe be combined or they could be going into mm -hmm. a commercial off the shelf app. app. And so, right. so it's, it's an interesting exercise and in, in where things kind of what buckets they fall into eventually. And, um, and, and uh, what, what work you have to do to actually get them to be able to modernize. Tell me about some of the challenges that you and your customers face when you're trying to modernize applications. I think really getting to the people that can help make the decisions and have the answers. Um, a good example would be uh, if, if somebody's trying to modernize some of their data estate and, they, and maybe they want to use um, some BI tools to get better, more uh, enriching uh, insights out of their data. So you can imagine that uh, this is an exercise that it's a little hard for a third party to come in because we just don't know. And and if you've looked at old databases, which uh, if you've been around a while, you, you probably have. Boy, there's a lot of sins in hidden in that, that, that schema. Yeah, like what? Well, okay. So 
you know, there's you go gluttony, into this. There's a sloth. There's there's seven of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, which one would it be? Uh, it hoarding, <laughs> gluttony, hoarding, kind of thing. Um, you know, sometimes I've gone into databases where the column, you know, you'll have every column essentially duplicated or triplicated because oh, someone yeah. couldn't make it. And so you'll see like, uh, you know, first name underscore one, first name underscore two, you know, <laughs> and, and it's like, why are there three first names in this table? Um, and so things like that, and then getting to the person that understands it or abbreviations, you know, if it's, if it's coming from an old legacy system or a mainframe, which had a specific naming convention and very limited characters, uh, width. Right. And so then you're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Um, and, and yeah. I call that so, the disemvoweling of <laughs> fields yeah. and variables. Yeah. So those types of challenges, I think are, are probably the things we spend the most time on chasing down the right people that can help, you know, really provide some kind of context around what the naming convention means, um, and where the business value is. And again, it, some of that may not be even useful anymore, but you can't make that decision until you really know what it is. Oh. So just understanding the application and the data and the functionality, what, what the terms mean, right? That's, there's a lot of time invested in that. Yeah. Yeah. I think if, if everything, if we had all the information we needed and had the stakeholders availability, there was no scheduling challenges, these would go, you know, they would probably be done in half the time or a third of the <laughs> okay. time, you know? Yeah. Well, let's talk about this. That, those, that, those challenges are all upfront, right? When you start uh, asking questions about the application and understanding it, what, what about once you start getting the execution? Is that, are there things that uh, specifically stand out to you? Yeah. And I, you know, depending on which road you're going down, I think, I personally think one of the values that uh, people like myself will bring in the next five to 10 years is really being comfortable with brownfield development. So like you said, it's fun to have greenfield development starting from scratch. You've got all the best patterns and practices you can bring into play, but the real challenge is the practicality of, of, of really taking an approach that's strategic and uh, pragmatic uh, for, for, okay, where we're at today, where we want to go, what chunks are worth carving out and maybe trying to modernize what chunks can be left alone. And, and though I, I, I'm a big believer in the 80, 20 rule. And so if I find the pattern or, 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 or uh, structure that's really helpful, I make the decision that I can't use it a hundred percent of the time. And I, I try to go into it with that. So entity framework um, has been around for what, 15 years now, something like that. Right. Um, really great tool um, for, you know, just kind of persisting your data into a structured database. Uh, it's very powerful. Uh, it's great. You can do the code first version. You can do the schema first. You've got a lot of options there. Um, but sometimes you want to have the ability to write your own SQL for a variety of reasons. Maybe you're doing a common table expression. Maybe you need to do some recursion. There's so many different things that may require you to go outside of the entity framework from a practical standpoint, a performance standpoint. And so if you facilitate your structure and your solution in a way that accommodates that, you know, 10 to 20% that's, that's going to be an outlier, you're going to not get upset with the paralysis analysis or, or trying to shoehorn your, your solution with something that doesn't really fit because you've tried right. to make the decision that always has to fit into this. And so I think that's probably the thing over my career that's been the most helpful is, is a pragmatic approach to that 80, 20 rule of, okay, this pattern is a great because it helps us 80% of the time and it solves, you know, 80% of our problems in most ways. And when we do have to fall outside of that, that's okay. But we right. want to make those decisions strategically. And, um, you know, I think that, that idea, whether you're doing the rehost or the re-architecture, I'm sorry, the, 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 the refactor or, uh, re-envisioning a solution, the idea that you have the ability to have those kind of escape hatches everywhere along the line is really important because uh, dogma is kind of going to kill any momentum. And so you have to be willing right. to understand uh, where those, where those, um, where those boundaries should be. I've discovered that there is very little dogma in this industry. There's a, <laughs> a very little times that I say always. Right. And uh, I like this. Uh, this is, you know, the metaphor of the, the golden hammer. I've, I've fallen into that trap myself. I have this tool it's awesome, and therefore I should use it everywhere. And there are just times, as you say, that uh, no, that, that actually isn't the best tool. I need to keep right. an open mind about that. Um, uh, any other challenges we could highlight? Yeah, I guess um, I think the analysis of different tools, um, and and so you know, we talk about patterns. It's not that much different for tools, but 
there's so many different solutions when it comes to, um, you know, how people interact with, with, with your solution, uh, whether it's just integration, whether it's ETL, you know, how the inputs and outputs work. Um, and, and when you're thinking about, you know, like, let's say that you do want to expose, uh, the APIs for the solution that you're building, do you use something like APM, API management Do you use Apigee? If you're doing background integrations, do you use MuleSoft? Do you use, um, logic apps. It, there's so many decisions about, about yeah. things. And I think that cha those challenges are off, awful, off, often, uh, areas where you spend just, just a, a, a decent amount of time. And I think as you go down these particular paths and, and start this modernization journey, I think having a process for those evaluating those particular solutions and those tools, um, is, is going to be important because you want to make sure that you're doing the proper amount of analysis. You're not overanalyzing. And, um, and I think when you think about building solutions, you also want to build them in a modular way. So if you do go down the road of API management and you decide Apigee needs to be there. And it, a lot of times the organizations are, are, are dealing with maybe multi-cloud or they're dealing with acquisitions. And so you have the, you know, a lot of factors and outside forces that might be causing you to make decisions and, and it's not always predictable. And so you don't want to just throw everything out the window when something like that happens. And the more you're willing to uh, accommodate change, the happier I think you're going to be. And there's a lot of practical ways to do that. So I think, you know, you don't want to overanalyze, and you, but you want to accommodate the potential change in the future in, in a practical way. So uh, that's easier said than done, but I think that's another challenge. Yeah, I think that also makes uh, your application more testable if you've got... Um... Uh, the separation of concerns. That, Absolutely. Uh, you, not only can you swap out and say, I don't know, I'm, I'm using SQL today, but I'm going to use Oracle tomorrow, or I'm on Azure today, but I'm going to be on AWS tomorrow. Um, but just being able to test the business logic outside of those decisions is really helpful. Right. Um, yeah. Now, for you mentioned some tooling that is goes into the application itself. Is there tooling that helps you when you're designing and architecting? Uh, definitely. Um, I, I've kind of shifted over to Visual Studio Code for pretty much everything I've I've been doing over the last uh, I don't know, I don't know three, four, or five years now, um, which is, you know, kind of my struggle. My my system now is I've got a Linux server down in my basement, and I just do all my code remotely with a dev container there. So I have really it's just less friction for me on on, on Linux, and so I have. Uh, probably 50 different dev containers in there and some of them rust. I've got Python. I've got obviously a variety of different .NET solutions and, and it's just a way, it's a kind of a playground. And of course, if I'm working on client projects, then, you know, there's ways of structuring that and that really works well. Um, the, the dev container itself, if it's very, very similar to GitHub. Um, oh gosh, it's not code spaces. Is it code spaces? I think it is code spaces. There is code spaces in GitHub. Yeah, absolutely. Crazy. Very similar. Well, uh, like a mini virtual machine or container exactly yeah and environment you, and your code in it you define the the extensions you need for vs code you define uh obviously the the core or base uh container implementation image that you need and anything that you need to add on to it uh and you can you know if you have your own custom extensions in your organization you can provide those and and mm -hmm. so for developer a as they put that together and commit it to source control developer b can come down and get all of that stuff just bootstrapped and and the nice thing about that is if you have you know six versions of of go or six versions of net they don't collide with each other now a lot of right. that is is easier than it used to be but back in the day boy um <laughs> uh, and and you know this is where that brownfield development comes in if you do have yeah. old code that you might use the GAC or something like that um, yeah, you want to keep that separated from everything else so you don't have bugs in your development process and then deploy it out to production and, and all of a sudden, um, you know, they're not there or they're only there in production and they don't exist on your dev environment. So it yeah. just gives you the ability to create a very similar experience and a very uh, predictable uh, type of develop development environment between each developer. And so you get less of this, hey, it works on my machine kind of thing, which was the bane yeah. of our existence for so long. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll share with you my, uh, I used to be in the consulting world for many years, and my very last consulting job was a brownfield application that they wanted to port from, I think, .NET 1.1 to whatever the version was 10 years ago. And at first, I was really disappointed that I, oh, I'm working with old technology, and this is really awful code, you know, with you know, 
thousands of lines in a method and no separation of concerns. And I actually, uh, I read uh, a book by Michael Feathers about uh, maintaining legacy applications. And I realized that there is a science behind this, that there is, I, 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 my, my disappointment was I thought I'm not going to be learning anything new because I'm working with old code. That was totally false. There, was, there is something to be learned in how to tease out parts of the application that are tightly coupled so they can be tested, so they can be modernized, so they can mm -hmm. be improved and uh, not break things. So that's that's my experience with brownfield application development. Yeah, and I think that that's why I say in the next five to ten years, I do think there's going to be huge opportunity for people that are comfortable, really just figuring. They can obviously uh, comprehend what they're seeing. Uh, they have to interpret the patterns of whatever the author of that solution and the architect were, why they did things they they did, and then figure out a path to getting something that's better. Um, well, not, you know, well, keeping the lights on in some cases you yeah. have, you know, you don't have no choice, but to deploy these on a regular basis while you're making changes and modernizing things. And so those are, to me, that that's fun and challenging. I think much more challenging than Greenfield. I mean, Greenfield may have the breadth and, and just, uh, you know, just, just a, a large number of lines of code. But, um, if you just take textbook, you know, kind of patterns, so, okay, we just use this pattern here and go from scratch and use the best of breed of everything. Okay. Well, you don't have as many decisions to make and it's not nearly as challenging and it's, it. you know, potentially easier for someone with less experience to go down that road. Mm. Is there anything we haven't covered uh, that on this topic that you feel is critical? Yeah. So I think from, from my perspective, one of the guidelines and guiding principles I like to, to kind of surround myself by are 12 factor apps. Um, and I think that that gives you a good foundation for, what types of design patterns you want to use, what frameworks you want to adopt, um, and, and, you know, why you would do that. It, it's not just a, you know, set of, it, it doesn't necessarily say, okay, use an Azure function here, use containers there. It's, it's more or less guiding principles that you have to be able to comprehend and then use that to actually apply uh, technology to it appropriately in the right cases. And I've, I've definitely used that over probably the last decade or so of trying to really, mm -hmm. Uh, I guess it's probably more like a decade. I don't know if it's been around much longer than that, but using those principles to say, okay, well, this is, this is why we do things the way we do. This is, this is an advantage of, of kind of uh, taking this particular methodology and then applying the technology to it because it helps us accomplish that. And it helps us be a little more um, agnostic about some of the implementation details, because nowadays you can build a container, uh, you can run it in Kubernetes, you can run it on a variety of different Azure ecosystems, if we think about um, Azure Functions, um, Azure con uh, con uh, Container Apps, Azure Container Instances, App Services, you can just take a container image and plop it into a variety of different uh, runtimes and they're portable and, you know, they have all the dependencies, just like we were talking about in the dev containers, they're all, you know, built in with those dependencies. And so that becomes a really great way of doing things. But you can't, you have to do that in the right way because you're not going to have, um, maybe you, you need something that of shared files or something like that, or you need a shared cache, or maybe you're doing sockets and you need a backplane that's going to make sure that you're not distributing things uh, 20 times over, or just to the one group of audience members that are attached to the, you know, one piece of, of, or the one container running that actually got the message. So there's a lot of things that you have to do the right way when you actually um, build out applications in order to take advantage of um, um, some of the modern architectural strategies. And 12-factor has a lot of great principles to help you get there. Yeah, interesting. You're the second person this week that has brought up this 12factor.net uh, is the website. Mm -hmm. yep. And I've been looking at it uh, actually the last few days. It's a lot of, I love the, I love not only the information, but I love the simplicity of it. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a easily consumable set of principles. Very much so. Uh, we are almost at time. But before we go, I wanted to just talk really briefly about the fact that you have a recording studio <laughs> in your house. I do. Tell me about that. I wish I, I would I would pivot my camera over there, but it's probably pretty embarrassing how messy this room is. Um, <laughs> Maybe we can have another show where we focus on it, but just, just talk about it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I've, I've been a musician for um, pretty much my entire life. Saying most, uh, I would say mostly I'm a singer. Um, I was a music director at a church a number of years ago, and... Uh, I kind of learned to play piano to help accommodate my singing and uh, other people's singing. And so, um, so I have uh, kind of uh, all the microphones and the equipment mixers and 
compressors that allow me to record things in multi-channel and of course PCs and MacBooks give you the ability to do that pretty easily these days. But I've been doing it for probably about 30 years and I've had as many as, I don't know, 30 tracks of audio with trombones, uh, flutes and and it's such a single song. Yeah. And it's shocking how you can blend synthesizers and real mu- real instruments and boy, you, you can't tell the difference. And, and uh, wow. I've, I've had some, I'm not the arranger in, in those particular examples. I had a friend that did arranging and he was phenomenal at it. Um, but it, it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I got the, the multi-track recording to uh, Superstition by Stevie Wonder. And Great song. It's, oh, it's one of the best songs ever. And you can actually hear the horn players tapping their feet when you isolate the tracks. <laughs> and just takes you back in time to the 70s. I think it was in the 70s when that song it was. was recorded. I think and... it's on the Talking Book album, but I'm not sure about that. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and even the chain from the kick drum, which now they it's not as common to use a chain, but you could kind of hear a little squeak in the chain because um, uh, the mics are so close when you isolate the track. Sure. So, you know, boy, it's a lot of fun. Sliding up and down the frets of the guitar. Yep, yep. Really cool stuff. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's something I do in my free time. I wish I did more of it, but... Uh, um, uh, but yeah. are you sharing this online or through eight track tapes or, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's less embarrassing. I say a track cause nobody can come and come and listen. I have a, probably a couple songs on YouTube. Um, I think right now my main focus is trying to get my vocals as good as I possibly can, because, um, uh, as much as I love, uh, the rest of the music, I think people pay the most attention to that. And, um, I have a walk-in closet across this hall uh, wall here and, that does a pretty good job of giving me a lot of flexibility to add effects without a lot of external wow. impact of, of natural reverb and things like that. So very that's, cool. that's what I do. All right. Thanks for sharing. Uh, if you send me any links, I'll share them in the show notes. Yeah, for sure. Ben, uh, this is really educational. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you for having me. been great being on your show. Um, I will consider you a friend now uh, that we've had all this opportunity to talk about technology and, and all this great stuff. So thanks for having us. Uh, be. <laughs>